so thank you for the introduction. It's nice to be back. Um, it's a little weird to be back because I feel like I should be dissertating or something, like I'm supposed to be doing work. Um, but I actually just get to be here to hang out with you guys and chat. So um, I'm going to share with you a bit of research that I've done in the past and how it's leading into some stuff that's new and in the future. And so I went to that other school across the bay. It was a lot of fun. Um, and have worked at a few places, gone to grad school here, um, worked at a few other places, and volunteered at other places, and landed at UC Santa Cruz, right? So I've had this sort of weird career path um, where after I finished grad school, I just said I did not want to be a professor. <laughs> uh, it's a rough life. Um, so I worked at a place that was kind of amazing, which I'll tell you a bit about uh, in this talk where we were working on open source robotics, right, and trying to make robots more usable by normal people, not just robot whisperers. Um, and so I've had this sort of path through industry and academia and back to industry um, where we see all the same research questions coming up, right? And the nice thing about being able to walk those lines is that you can be grounded in real world problems while also drawing upon all of the theory, right, that we've got in human computer interaction, human robot interaction. Uh, psychology, sociology, anthropology, what do we know about people that we can apply to the design of technology, right, to make it better for us, to work for us. Um, you may have noticed the shape <laughs> of that curve, so I'm actually from not that far away, um, and Santa Cruz is a little bit like Hawaii, but not quite, it's a little colder. In case you don't know where Santa Cruz is, we are where the Red Star is right now, and it's not that far away. I would encourage you to consider coming to visit, um, because there's other places that do fun robotics work too. Um, besides just here on the farm. We have, you know, deer who get in the way as you're going to the parking lot. Um, they walk in front of my office all the time. The turkeys are also cute, but they're kind of jerks. Um, they will bite your tires if they see you in a car. Um, and we have walkways that look, you know, not that bad. Stanford is a beautiful place, um, and that is a beautiful place too. So think about it. It's about 40 minutes drive from here. Uh, this is where my office is. So, and that's the bike ride home. Just, just a little pitch. We are taking applications for our lab. Um, I think, you know, for me, as a social scientist studying human-robot interaction, there was this really inspiring moment that happened just up the hill from here, um, where we went from this sort of space where people thought computers were these big monstrous machines in rooms where you had to be a person with the job of the name computer in order to make use of that technology, right? And, you know, places like SRI and at Xerox Park, right, and then at Apple, uh, we got to the point where computers became personal and usable by end users, people who are not necessarily trained, right? So we took this amazing technology that were sort of glorified calculators um, and put them in the hands of normal people, and then we got to see what they did with that. Um, and it's been pretty amazing. Now you have supercomputers in your pockets, um, and we take that for granted. I think robotics is not there yet, right? Robotics is still a space where you probably want to have a PhD in computer science or robotics if you're gonna do anything useful with these things. And that's okay, but I think a more exciting future would be one where we can put these tools in the hands of other people who are not necessarily trained um, in these disciplines to see what they do with it. And so someone who's been working very actively on that, actually this was invented here, uh, the personal robot one, um, was made of wood. <laughs> Even the gears were made of wood. It was an awesome prototype. Um, and the team here was prototyping different kinds of tasks that these robots could do around the home, right? And this kind of reminds me of Rosie the Robot, right? There's a reason why it's in the home and dishwashers. Uh, and we at Willa Garage took this idea from PR1, stole a couple of their PhD students, and made PR2 out of metal. Um, and that has become a research platform that you've probably seen in a bunch of places, and lots of YouTube videos, right, from robotics research labs. So we built this robot, and that's what people tend to point to when they talk about Willow Garage. Willow Garage is in Menlo Park, not real far away. Um, but I think what's more important is the things that we've learned from building that thing. Uh, first of all, people don't want 500-pound mobile manipulation robots in their homes. They tend to destroy your carpet. Um, and lots, of other, lots of other things too. Um, and we don't really know what they're for yet, but we're working on figuring that out, right? And so the things I think that I learned from that are things that I'm gonna share with you today. So yes, we worked on big, real robots, right? 32 degree of freedom mold manipulation platforms. But the ones that made it out into the world as products, I think, also teach us a bit of a lesson about, you know, how should we take bits of robotics and bits of autonomy and turn them into products and services that can help people today, right? So. I'm going to start with a little bit of a story. Some of you have heard this before. Um, so this is a familiar scene, probably, especially for those who do, you know, remote collaboration. Um, this is my coworker. 
Dallas. Dallas was a voice in a box on a table, as far as I was concerned, right? So I would go to meetings, and Dallas would be this like thing talking in the middle of the, the desk, right? And we would be having discussions about how to make decisions about you know which kinds of boards we should be using for the motor controllers um, for the big PR2 robot. And the way that our electrical engineering team made decisions at that time was they would sit at a table and scream at each other for hours until somebody won, and then they would go with that decision. And if Dallas was screaming as a voice in a box on a table, and they didn't like what he was saying, they would just hang up on him, right? Um, and be like, oh, we don't know what happened, right? We lost the connection, my bad. But by the way, this is the decision we came up with, and like, you're going to have to help us implement that. Um, and so for Dallas, it was not awesome. <laughs> Uh, he had some friends in the company who he'd worked with before. He went to college with them, and so they helped him out a bit. So they're like, okay, fine, we'll give you a laptop. We, we'll see your face. Maybe then it'll be harder for people to hang up on you, right? So he was Skype on a laptop on a cart, um, which actually was the system, <laughs> and with a, a little bit of a better microphone than normal and bigger speakers, so we would hear him, he'd be present. Um, and that worked a little better. It is a little harder to hang up on someone when they can see you reach for the power cable. Um, but sometimes we would forget to invite him to the meeting. Be like, I don't know where the cart is, or whatever, we don't have time, right? Or we'd have a conversation in the kitchenette in the morning where we actually do like the real discussion and then the meeting we pretend like we're having the discussion again and making the decision. But actually everything happened outside of the meeting, which is often how work really gets done. Uh, and so he was still kind of missing out on a lot of the real discussion and a lot of the real decision making because to us he was just like some guy who was annoying and had to be added to meetings, right? So um, he happened to be in town one weekend just before the big BattleBots competition because he was a BattleBots competitor. Uh, they were busy putting together table saws so that they could chop up all the other robots in the stadium. Uh, as they were chopping those things up, he decided to steal some body parts from our PR2 and the following Monday, this is Dallas actually coming into work looking like that with a big lead acid battery in the base, <laughs> a very expensive caster in the back stolen from the PR2. And here he can now pounce on us to ask us questions that he already asked us an email, but this time you actually need to answer because if you don't, he's not going to get out of that doorway and leave you alone, right? And so now that you're a mobile robot in a space with a face, nobody's going to shut you off unless they're actually your really close friend and that's cool to do. Um, and so <laughs> Dallas, uh, became this robot in our world that we talked to and hung out with every day. Uh, and I'll be, to be totally honest, I thought it was stupid the first time that I saw it. It was like, that, that's so gimmicky, right? And like, the only reason that we like it is because we like robots. Um, and we like him, he's actually kind of a nice person. But over time, what we learned was that he's really a person. Like, we got to meet his kids because of our time zone differences. His kids would drive around in the office at about 4 p.m. When we played pool, he would come and hang out with us. He would sometimes go and like hide our trash cans from us just to screw with us in the middle of the night, right? Um, and he became a human. He became a friend and a colleague. And so then when we had big discussions where we're yelling at each other in the room, we'd actually listen to him, right? And so even though it feels like this touchy-feely thing, we're like, yeah, you're getting to know him, that's cool, whatever. Actually, he was more effective at his job because of this, because he had more presence, because it was really hard for us to ignore him and turn him off when we didn't want to listen to him, right? So then the question became, okay, we're supposed to be building these big robots that are really fancy and do everything that Rose the Robot did, but we're actually finding a lot of value in doing this too. So this became a little skunk work side project uh, where the team decided to build a few more of those. They got a slightly better set of skins. Um, those are still, you know, it's just Skype on a stick on wheels, right? And so I know the roboticists in the room are going to say, that's not a robot, fine, whatever. You can add LiDAR to it. We did have Hokuyos down here, so you could do, you know, some obstacle avoidance. Um, but I think the real question was, is anyone going to use it? Can they use it? Is it going to be valuable enough to be worth putting up with the hassle? of dealing with these systems. And that's when they turn to me and they're like, Layla, you deal with humans, you go figure this out, <laughs> right? Uh, so I went and dealt with the humans. And my job became to field these um, out in the world. I will say, just you know, because this is an academic classroom, we did not invent this, right? Uh, these systems have existed for decades before we ever did this at Willow Garage. So I think the earliest one was probably the personal roving presence or the prop system made by Eric Paulus at UC Berkeley. Um, and I remember when we first started talking about this work with Eric, he's like, thank you for finally doing the user studies that my advisor said I should have done, but I didn't because it was too much of a pain in the butt. 
Um, and actually back then, so in the 90s, if you tried to do video conferencing, you know, so streaming video and audio up and down constantly in a building, you would bring down the network in the building within about 10 minutes, right? And so I think just at that time, the wireless networks weren't prepared for that kind of demand and that kind of load. But by the time we were doing it, it was kind of sort of doable. Another really fun one that I like uh, is, where'd it go? Over here, this is HP Labs. Uh, and you'll see they actually had a 360 degree view of the person. So you could identify them even from the back of their heads, right, if they're walking down the hallway. That thing was so wide that it barely fit through doorways. Um, but it did barely fit through doorways. So it was kind of, it was fine. It had a much larger girth, of course, because of that. So there's a bunch of design trade-offs here to think about, right, when you're building these systems. There's now more products on the market where these things are really being built. Right? And so because the wireless networks are ready, because you don't actually need to have a ton of autonomy to make this work, it's a product. Um, hospitals are using them for doctors to do rounds. Right? So if you have a specialist who the patient needs to see, but your particular clinic doesn't have that kind of specialist around, they can use one of these systems to let those doctors come and check you out right? with the help of the nurses and the other staff. Um, a lot of folks also do remote work right? use these systems. These are earlier prototypes of systems that have since been trucked. Um, I will say it's a little weird to have someone talking to your chest. Um, those designs have sort of you know, disappeared now, but we're learning over time you know, what is a socially appropriate way of talking to someone via robot, uh, which is what a lot of our studies were about. There are other ways of being remotely present, right? Um, and so you know, if you're Ishiguro-sensei, you can make an Android that looks just like yourself, right? Um, but that also means that now your grand, grad students could puppeteer you to say whatever they want you to say. Um, and another challenge with this, right, is you now need to have an Android for every person, right? Each person needs to be replicated um, in an expensive system, but you do get to look like yourself, which is pretty cool. Um, another challenge that we've been, he's been learning about is that you age, but your robot doesn't, or at least not in the same way, <laughs> right? Like our rubber doesn't fall apart, um, but our hair changes, like sometimes you gain a little wig, a little chubbier, um, and your robot doesn't, and people can still compare you. So there's challenges here. And you know, when I talked with Ishiguro about this, he's like, it's, this is the best system. Your robots are creepy. And I tell him, no, ours is the best system. Your robot, robots are, that, that's creepy. Uh, I think this is even creepier. Um, so <laughs> right, one of the challenges that we posed was, OK, now you got to build one for every single person. And so their answer to that was, well, you just make a baby. right? Because babies are like anonymous people that could turn into anybody, sort of like a Tamagotchi. right? Um, and so you know, you could talk to your grandma on the robot that looks like that. Um, and that will solve the problem. And I think, I, I, I don't understand. But I think you know, there, are, there are different cultural backgrounds that we are coming from that make things more or less socially acceptable. So I think I just don't get it. Um, but this is a possible design direction, right? And folks like here, so Osama has been working on some really cool robots that look like humanoids in the ocean. And you know, there are places where maybe you do want it to look like a person, because then you can teleoperate it more effectively, right? So if I can't scuba dive, at the depths that we need to be able to scuba dive to get the samples from the ocean that we want, right? maybe it does make sense to make systems that move like we do so that I have a more natural understanding of how to control that thing. Right? That might be one argument for going in this direction. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying there's a, lot of, there's a big design space. We happen to pick one direction. It might be wrong. Right? Um, it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve for that end user. What is the goal of the task? So, when I talk about these systems, I made up some vocabulary. If you catch me saying local, I mean the person who is proximate to the system, so in the same physical space. If you catch me saying remote pilot, I'm talking about the person like Dallas, right, who's in Indiana but coming here in California via robot. So the question was, is anyone going to use it? Are we just weird nerds who like robots, right? And that's why we're using this thing. Um, or is there something valuable there that other people could actually make use of, right? We already have video conferencing. It works pretty well. Is this going to be any better? And so I fielded over a dozen of these over time and for much longer than this by the end of the study. But at the beginning of the study, we got to publish some of that work. Uh, and I can share that with you here today. So we looked at three different companies, not our own. It took a long time to get NDAs in place. <laughs> and they let us shadow them for many months just to see how they use it or don't use it. Right? So we weren't pushing the product onto them. We said, like, here, just borrow this thing, see if you want it. Actually, at all of these sites, they had those big video conferencing systems up in the walls for public spaces that were all shut off for various reasons. So I do think that there are some limitations of current video conferencing that don't make persistent presence work that well. 
Their physical robot bodies were all located here in the San Francisco Bay Area because these are prototypes and they break all the damn time. Uh, but the remote pilots were actually remote. Uh, my favorite remote pilot was actually here um, in Singapore. He was everybody's favorite sysadmin who would fix things at 2 a.m. because 2 a.m. for him uh, is different than 2 a.m. for us, right? And so they'd send him emails whenever they wanted and they'd come into work in the morning and be done. Um, that was great for their team. And when he visited in person, he seriously got like hugs and high fives from everybody because he was everybody's favorite sysadmin. Um, he was not everybody's favorite sysadmin for the cleaning staff who we forgot to brief at the site in Mozilla. <laughs> right, so you can imagine, right, you're used to, we had, we had done a brown bag talk where we gave people a heads up, like, hey, there's gonna be this thing rolling around your space. It's not, it doesn't have guns, don't worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but we didn't warn the folks who were going to be there in the middle of the night because we didn't know that they were there. And so for them, it was actually kind of terrifying <laughs> to see like a dude rolling around watching them do their work when normally it was quiet in the space. So for them, it was super upsetting. Um, so that was a mistake that we learned from, right? Like you actually need to debrief everyone, everyone, not just the people who are going to be interacting with it during the day. What do they do with these systems, right? The first thing is, you know, they kind of do what they do when they're there in the office in person, right? This is not really that different from the chit chat that normally happens in offices. I think what's more interesting than what they're doing is where they were doing it. And so if you look at the physical locations in the office where they're talking, right? Usually we use fancy video conferencing systems like this one uh, in big formal meeting spaces, right? So like a lecture hall or a boardroom or a meeting room with like the fancy tables. Um, these are used in informal communication spaces, right? So remember the kitchenette where the real conversation happens before the meeting, <laughs> where everyone actually makes decisions, right? Or you chat about the weekend so you can get to know your coworkers as people instead of just as transactive coworkers, right? And so the best space actually to talk with folks tends to be right when they've started to make their coffee because they're stuck uh, for at least a minute right, while their coffee is dripping. And so you can chit chat with them and it'd be kind of rude for them to walk away and be like, I'm busy, I'm waiting for my coffee, right? And instead they're gonna maybe give you a chance to like get to know them. So there's different tactics for using these systems. In previous work that has looked at video conferencing, right, so Bonnie Nardi's done a lot of work in the CSCW space, um, Computer Supported Cooperative Work, where they find that teleconferencing systems basically support three things. Um, which are these, and I'll go through each in turn. And robots, robot media communication is kind of similar. So the first thing that we see is that when people bother to show up, right, when you put that butt in that chair and are present and taking notes and participating, you're communicating to your team that you care about your project, you care about your shared goals, you get better outcomes usually out of those types of collaborations. So this was actually the director for Firefox. So his team was in Mountain View, he lived in Toronto. And normally what he would do is log into that video camera in the back of the room, so kind of like these cameras here. The problem with that is that no one else gets to see you, the audience who's in that camera, right? But if you show up in Robot, which is actually a pain in the butt to do because <laughs> it was a prototype, um, your teammates then feel like you care more. They're more likely to come and chat with you afterwards, right? Turns out that he was actually blocking the view of the woman behind him because his head was too big, um, which we never figured out a good solution for. <laughs> but as a team, overall, right, they felt better about him being their director, right, because they could just chat with him. He was more just like a person who was present and who cared. Another thing that I briefly touched on earlier, right, is you can get people's attention. <laughs> when you send an email that's just some text on the screen that someone can ignore, they might ignore it. But when you roll into someone's office and block their doorway until they answer, you answer their question, um, you're probably going to answer. <laughs> you're probably going to talk to them. Uh, and if you don't leave until you feel like it, right, it's kind of like someone just barging into your office or pouncing on you in the hallway. Same thing, right? They can keep your attention longer than they could through other media. Uh, I did learn over time how to hear that robot coming because there was this like really high pitched sound that the motor controllers would make. Um, and so sometimes if I didn't want to talk to Dallas and I heard him coming, you could like run out the door of the building because he can't open doors. Um, <laughs> which is my workaround for that problem. It's kind of like hearing footsteps, right? You can sometimes tell who the person is who's coming into your office and decide if you want to pretend like you're there or not. Um, same thing. Later on, we used uh, these hub motors that are silent. That screwed up my plan. Um, so then they could pounce on you whenever they really wanted. And that was a little startling. So actually, you do want a little bit of noise because people make noise, right? We hear you coming. You don't just suddenly appear behind someone. That's creepy. Um, Last bit that's super important is this, hanging out 
and building real social connections, getting to know your coworkers as people, right? As full people, not just the person that you sit with and sit across the meeting room table from. Uh, around five o'clock or sometimes four o'clock on Fridays, um, our team would often start playing pool just because it was a thing to do. This was a super warped table that was not that great and quite frankly the robots would kick our butts playing this because geometry is easy for robots and hard for people. Um, but they just do it for fun. Nobody was very good at it. And if you were there via robot, you don't get to play pool because you don't have arms. Um, you could have arms. You still probably wouldn't be that good. Um, but you can heckle the people who are playing pool. Right? And that's just something that coworkers do. It's how you build rapport. It's how you build relationships. Um, and that kind of relationship is what makes it possible to have difficult conversations later on when you need to without feeling like you're really being threatened. You, know, you understand that everyone's on the same side when you've hung out together a bunch. Um, and you can get through the hard stuff. You can work through the hard stuff better and more effectively once you've met in person and hung out. So, you know, all those things sort of gave us some evidence that maybe there's something there. And so we spun out a company called Suitable Technologies that was in Palo Alto, just got purchased. Um, this is the interface that came out during that time. It's not awesome, but it was a lot worse before, I promise. Um, so you drag your body around via this graphical user interface. The first version was a web browser based interface, and then we decided to do a native one. People tend to forget what they look like when they're a robot, and so we remind them by putting mirrors around the space. Um, that actually ended up being really important because people are not good at presenting themselves via robot. Um, and so that was what came out of sort of that work, right? There's enough confidence to say, like, maybe there's something there. If you have seen Shellbot, no, we did not rip off Shellbot. Um, Shellbot was our robot. I always get this question. <laughs> um, so the folks who do the Big Bang Theory show really, really do their homework. Like, they're, they're real nerds. Um, they found our YouTube video of the first prototypes when like nobody cared or was looking at it. Um, and they called up our team and they said, hey, we want to use your robot for one of our episodes. Is that cool? Um, and our team was so giddy with excitement that we dropped everything that we were doing to help them do the shoot. Um, and actually, Kurt Myers, who was on this team, the core team that developed this, he was on that BattleBots group. Um, he loves the Big Bang Theory so much that he had their theme song as his wedding march down the aisle. So when these guys called, it was freaking awesome, right? <laughs> and so, yes, we dropped everything to do this show. Um, the robot was not perfect, right? So the screen wasn't really that bright, right? If you've seen you know, old displays like that. And so they had to shoot the entire episode almost in the dark so that the screen would be bright enough relative to everybody else's faces. But it kind of worked. Um, Steve Wozniak was the guest actor on this particular episode. So he signed the back of its head. Um, and we still have that robot today. So that was kind of cool. People do weird things, crazy things, that we never would have expected with these robots. Um, anybody know who that guy is? Snowden. Yeah, Snowden. Um, there are people who do not want to be in the United States physically because they'll get arrested. Um, and, but they do want to be able to give talks, right, so that their message is heard. And so it turns out you can use telepresence robots for that because, like, who cares if they arrest the robot, right? Fine, whatever. I'm still good. Um, and so he used it to give a TED talk. Um, which works, that is not a use case that we had anticipated, <laughs> right? Like, it's not until you put this stuff out in the world and you see the crazy things that people do that you start to understand, like, what's it really for, right? And so stuff like that happens and you learn from it, which is kind of neat. So I said, you know, we learn from the real world. Uh, we do, I do exploratory field studies because for me, that's the best inspiration for finding, like, what are the important questions here, right? And so based on those questions, we form hypotheses about what if we designed it this way? What if we designed it that way, right? How might we make it better? Um, and so to test those hypotheses, you run controlled experiments. So these look like psych experiments, except instead of only having people, you throw in a robot or two also um, and see what happens behaviorally and attitudinally. You learn from those studies. You figure out how those design changes actually affect user experience and use of the system. Uh, build a new prototype, right? Integrating those lessons and then rinse and repeat, right? We feel those prototypes, learn from them. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of these so you have a flavor of what that looks like. So in human robot interaction, we tend to be very empirical, right? We tend to work a lot with designers and other folks who know how to study humans as well as roboticists who know how to, what's possible to build, right? What is really doable in the near future. Before I go there, actually, are there any questions on that first set of studies? You good? Okay, cool. So, controlled experiments. Um, the ultimate design goal of the system is to make people feel like the remote coworkers are actually part of the team, right? So in social psychology, we call that in-group behavior as opposed to out-group behavior, right? So if you go to big game, right, and you are on the Stanford side, the, the red shirts are your in-group and the blue shirts are the out-group, right? 
Uh, and we tend to actually mark that with uniforms, right? It's a very powerful visual cue to tell you who's on your side and who's not. Who's, who should you throw the football to and who should you not throw the football to, right? Pretty clear. Uh, it turns out that if you do this with computers, it does almost the exact same thing to humans as it does when you do this to people. So if I give you a blue wristband <laughs> and I tell you you're on the blue team, randomly assigned, like you just, you're blue. And now I give you a little blue border and I tell you put that around the frame of your computer screen, just desktop. Uh, you will be nicer to that computer, you will spend more time with it, and you will think it's more competent than if I put a red border around it. It's silly, it's irrational, we know that that thing is not a human, it's not really a teammate, that's not even really my team, because you just told me what team I was on, but it works consistently with pretty much all humans, right? So we have this innate need to know who is part of us, who is one of us, and who is not, and we tend to extend it to other things besides just people. Um, that's all work that my advisor did here at Clifford Nass um, when we were in the communication department. And so we decided like, all right, let's try this with, with robots because we know it works with computers. It'll be great, right? We've got the blue person, we've got the blue robot, everything's gonna be good, we'll all be friends. <laughs> this study proved me wrong. Uh, so we do this study uh, with Irene Ray uh, and Bill Gay Mutlu who were at University of Wisconsin-Madison at the time. Um, Irene was interning with us and we're like, okay, we're gonna bring people into the room, they're gonna decorate the robot, they'll have a, discussion about a topic where they disagree and see if they can come to more agreement and at the end we'll do a questionnaire. So this is what that study looked like. They came into the study, we randomly assigned them to the condition where they personalize the system, we gave them the stuff to personalize it with, or not. Then we have them do a task uh, where people think that they should know the answers. <laughs> um, so we use the desert survival task which is a lot of fun because everybody always gets the answer wrong, but they're super confident in their answer. So you tell them this cover story of, okay, let's say that you're in the desert, you're on a bus tour, and your bus crashes. You have these 10 items to survive. Your job is to rank them in order of importance for your survival. And you would like to think that we know what items are important for our survival. Most people really don't, uh, but they do feel very strongly about their answers. And so you have them do that individually. Then you put them in a room, and you have them discuss with a remote participant, actually a confederate in our case. Um, and then you have them rank the items again to see if their new answers align more with their partners or if they just stick to their guns, right? They're like, no, I got the right answer. Uh, and then we do a, a disclosure interview at the end and chat with them about what their experience was like. So what happened? Um, we did a between participant study, meaning that each of the people in these cells was only in one condition of the study, right? They didn't do all of them. So we had people who did not decorate the robot, we had people who did decorate the robot. We also tried a framing that we know works for in-group behavior, which is you tell them, at the end of this study, we're gonna grade your performance on just your answer. So as long as you're right, you get all the points. Or we're gonna grade both of your answers as a team, you're interdependently scored, because we know this can work and we wanna see how it compares with decorating versus not decorating. We expected, right, that if you tell people we're gonna score both of you together, interdependent scoring, that you would be more in-groupy with your partner than if you were independently scored. And we do see evidence of that. So people will disclose more information about themselves if they're told that their final performance scores are interdependent. Um, <laughs> this makes me a little sad, but as humans, if we feel like someone is an out-group member, we tend to attribute more animal-like emotions to them. Animal-like are things that are basic, right? So anger, fear, happiness. Human-like emotions are more things like angst, right? They're a little more nuanced. And so if you notice that people attribute more animal-like emotions to a team that you don't really care about, that tends to indicate that's an out-group member. They also say that they like the pilot more if they're interdependent. That's kind of a no-duh. So the manipulation, that manipulation worked. The thing we really cared about, right, was if we do this blue team, red team thing and let people decorate it to look like themselves, are they gonna be nicer to that person and be, treat them more like an in-group member? The answer is no. And like big fat no with statistical significance, no. <laughs> so uh, what ended up happening in our data was that if you decorated the robot, you did not cooperate as much with your partner uh, and you don't really wanna talk to them as much <laughs> after the end of the study. Um, that hurt, uh, but you know, as experimentalists, you need to be open <laughs> to all of the possibilities out there. And so, you know, what are the competing hypotheses that might have predicted this result? When we did the debriefing with these participants, what they told us pretty consistently was this. 
um, if they're in the decorating condition, they're like, yeah, the robot was really cool. I really liked it. It was so it was so interesting to see. But like, who's that guy who was in the screen? Why are they in my robot, right? And so they were actually building relationships with the machine, right, the proxy, but not with the person on the other side. And so that's why we think it backfired on us, right? And so, yes, Cliff was right, right? Computers are social actors, robots are social actors, but in the telepresence situation, where the actor is actually a person inside of a machine, they seem to actually be orienting more towards the machine. <laughs> Um, one way we think that we might be able to fix this, right, is instead of having the local person just decorate a machine and then have some random person log into it, is you have the person log into it and they chat and together they decorate the machine, right? So it's more like an activity that's done together as opposed to one that's done um, independently and that's actually some follow-up work that we've been doing with folks at USC. Um, to look at, you know, this decorating thing, it just keeps happening. When people get robots, they want to put stuff on it to customize it for themselves. And so what are the psychological effects um, of those kinds of interactions? So don't let people decorate their robot before the telepresence folks log in. Another question that came up a lot <laughs> was around this. So people suck at driving robots. Uh, especially robots that have weird configurations like ours where it drives like a forklift. Right, forklift drivers, good forklift drivers are really hard to find. Um, it turns out good telepresence robot drivers are hard too. It is hard to walk and talk. And that is the thing you're supposed to do with this thing. <laughs> so usually what would happen is people would drive around, kind of like bumble into place, and they get to a meeting room, and then they just sit there still and just be a face on the screen, right? And the whole point of having presence, it's physical presence here, is that you don't have to do that. That you could move around if you wanted to. You could be more alive and more present in the space, but it's hard to do it. And so what if we added autonomous assistance, right? So at least a little bit of, say, obstacle avoidance to help people, like, not make mistakes. Um, and so we use that little LIDAR on the base. And, you know, it's just doing a little sweep at this level. And so you could probably avoid things like table legs or chairs or trash cans, right? Walls, do doors, definitely. Um, and so we created a cost map around the space of the robot. And so if I, as the pilot, tried to drive into this desk, it wouldn't let me. It would actually like replan my path around there. So I'd still get to where I'm trying to go, but it would make me not make mistakes and hit stuff. So it's pretty simple algorithms. The question though was, is it going to work? And is it going to work when humans have it in their hands? So we made an obstacle course an office space, right, because that was the kind of space that we were looking at. Uh, we put lots of things in its way, like chairs and trash cans and boards, and we told people, you know, go ahead and practice as much as you want until you feel comfortable with it, um, and then let us know when you're ready to go. And we measured how fast they could do the obstacle course and how many things they hit, so time on task and error rates, sort of standard performance metrics. Uh, here we did the controlled experiment. We randomly assigned people to one of two conditions, where either they have no autonomous assistance, so we just turn the LiDAR off, uh, or they do have autonomous assistance where we don't let them run into things. We also measured one other thing because we were worried that it was going to matter. <laughs> Turned out it did. There's this personality dimension from personality psychology from the 70s called locus of control. And here, this, this is all about how much control you feel like you should be in in the world. So if you have a very strong external locus of control, you probably believe things like, you know, stuff just happens, fate, you know, things, things go as they go, and, you know, I'm not really the one who's going to be controlling that, right? Like, I roll with the punches. If you have a strong internal locus of control, in contrast, you believe that you are the master of your own destiny. If you succeed, it is because you're amazing. If you fail, it's because you're terrible, right? You believe that you are in control of what happens in the world. Most people fall somewhere along this continuum. So we measured this as a personality dimension, and then we put people into two buckets, depending on the median split. So what do we expect to find? Our hypothesis was that if you have obstacle avoidance, you'll hit fewer things. Let's hope that works, right? Um, the other thing that we hoped was that you could drive faster, right? So you should be able to do the task better if you've got assistance. It turns out that, yeah, if you have obstacle wins, you hit fewer things. They still managed to hit one thing. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Maybe it was below the level of the LiDAR. Um, but, you know, that's a big statistical significant difference. That's a big effect size. Um, that was the surprising one, though, for us. So if you have autonomous assistance so that you won't hit things in this obstacle course, it actually takes you longer to finish than if you don't have autonomous assistance, which kind of goes counter to what we would expect. So we dug into the data a little deeper, right? We looked at that other variable. So locus of control, right? I am the master of my own destiny. I believe in fate and roll with the punches. 
So it turns out that if you need to be in control, you don't like to give up control to robots. <laughs> uh, if you give me autonomous assistance, but I don't want your stinking autonomous assistance because I want to be in control, I take longer to finish that obstacle course. And more specifically, this is the one that stands out as statistically significantly different than the other three, right? So here's the place where things blow up. This is for probably the person who really loves driving a stick shift car, but you force them into an automatic. <laughs> they get frustrated. They're like, if I want to hit the trash can, I'm going to hit the trash can. Watch me hit the trash can, right? And they're, they're showing you that they're frustrated by performing worse, right? They're like, I want to cut that corner sharper than it's letting me cut it. Why won't it let me do it? I'm going to try that one more time, right? And so behaviorally, we're actually seeing a performance decrement um, for those folks, which is important to think about as we're designing increasingly autonomous systems, right? Offering more assistance that, you know, they're intended to help. They're intended to make us do better, to drive better, to fly planes better. Um, but if you've got the wrong personality type matched with that autonomous assistance, you can get into trouble. Yeah, question. Just out of curiosity, so you told them, by the way, we have this extra autonomous thing that's going to be course correcting. Mm -hmm. Does it strike you as an option to just sort of make it subtle enough that it could still improve the yeah, we could, we could not tell them and see what happens. That would be an interesting follow-up study. Um, I think another one that could be cool is like, what if we give the manual override, right? Because that's currently, that's often a design decision, um, depending on what sort of your company believes about is the right thing to do, <laughs> you could offer that. Um, yeah, I think there's a bunch of different variations that we could and probably should do on studies like these to figure out really, you know, how is it that the human dimensions are going to be interacting with these autonomous systems that we're building. Because yes, autonomy can be amazing, but if there's a human in the loop that's going to fight it, then it's going to make the entire system performance worse, right? Um, so I think, yeah, thinking about the framing is super important. You maybe don't want to tell them, like, by the way, we're going to take control away from you, and then we're going to give it back to you, right? You might just say, like, it's just a co-pilot. It's just helping you out. You don't have to listen to it if you don't want to. Yeah? Uh, did you check with the intern locus guys who, or if they hit more um, objects, if they didn't get assistance than the external locus guys? So you're talking about internal locus guys with no assistance versus these guys? Yeah. Yeah, that one is not statistically significantly different. These are... Um, uh, but I mean in terms of hitting obstacles, so if they actually need the assistance Oh, more, I see. Yes. There we didn't see significant differences. Okay. Um, so if I didn't show the chart, it's because there was like too much noise in the data mm. <laughs> to see it. But maybe if we made the course harder, Right, or maybe if we change the precision of the obstacle avoidance, it might be different. That'd be an interesting thing to look at too. Yeah, and of course, like the you know, what are the consequences of hitting a trash can? Like not real big, um, but if you think about cars, and you hit a dog, right? That's a bigger consequence, or even worse than that. So I think you know people are more careful in different situations depending on what the consequences are. Here, I will say one weird thing that I keep seeing with these telepresence robots is. I think because it's a remote location from where your physical body is, sometimes they don't take it so seriously. Uh, and so we've had people log into these robots and like chase down our coworkers because they think it's fun. Um, I think because it feels like a game, right? And the interface is a little bit game-like. And so we would have to tell them like, please don't run over that person. Like, that's not nice. Like, that's a real person. They will actually bleed and it will actually hurt, <laughs> right? And so I think there is some, important things that we need to explore there around responsibility and like really understanding the consequences of our actions. Um, I think the same is going to be true for other remote controlled systems too. Yeah, that's a great question. Any others on this one before we move on? Okay, so I will say I totally did not do this stuff on my own. I've had an amazing set of collaborators on these projects. These are just a few of them. Um, they come from also amazing places, right? And so this is not work that like one person does on their own, right? Doing especially field studies, you need to have a large team of people to get that stuff done, right? Like spreading out across ten companies to shadow people as they're doing their work, talking with them about difficult things going on, um, takes time and people um, and resources, right? So of course we never do this stuff on our own. 